Welcome back, folks. Uh, we're going to take a real quick look at a technique called mass spectrometry. And this has become really important in a lot of proteomics and nutriomics and a lot of other omics that are used in cell biology. So let's take a look at how this works. First thing that has to happen is a biological sample has to be uh, obtained. So um, let's say that we're interested in comparing uh, some cells growing in one dish that haven't been treated in any way with some cells that have been uh, grown in identical conditions, except we've, let's say we've treated them with um, that drug mitomycin C that we talked about. And we want to know if there are any differences in the molecules that are found in these cells. So what we can do is we can create an extract of the cells. So we just break the cells open um, uh, from this sample, and that's going to be one sample. And then we can take our other sample, and we can break the cells open. That's called cell lysis, and we can prepare an extract of the cells, so all the molecules in the cell. And then we could use this technique to compare them. So here's what we're doing. You can think about doing it one sample, and then following up with the second sample, and looking to see how, how things differ. Um, so is what we would do is we, we could we could take a sample and the sample could be complex like the ones we just talked about or it could be simple like an amino acid for example. So if we think about a simple molecule, a simple sample here like an amino acid before it gets too complicated, if we take this sample and we inject it into the chamber of the mass spectrometer, uh, I'm going to call it a mass spec so it's just easier. And so if we inject the sample into this chamber in the mass spec, uh, when it goes into the chamber, it's bombarded by a beam of electrons from an electron gun uh, in that chamber. When that happens, um, electrons are knocked off of, off of the molecule, or the molecules that you put into the chamber, uh, and they become what are called parental ions. So they become positively charged ions. And those ions aren't necessarily inherently stable. They're actually going to break up into different types of a smaller fragment and those could be neutral or they could be positively charged obviously they could be charged in some way and so then um, those charged species those charged fragments we're going to call them species they are accelerated into a tube and using uh, electromagnets and so the sample then is sprayed through this tube and it's accelerated and then it's exposed to these large electromagnets. Now depending on the charge on these on these ionic species and their size, um, they're either going to move through the tube quickly or they're going to be deflected and move uh, and, and take longer to hit this detector down at the end of the tube. So based on how long it takes things to get down to the end of the tube, we can calculate what's called a mass to charge ratio. So here's what the data would look like from one of these samples. Now usually the heaviest thing that comes out is is the parental the parental ion and that would be here let's just think about this as a simple example that could be amino acid glycine so if we injected glycine into our chamber um, the parental line that would come through um, the heaviest and not necessarily the most abundant species could be the parental ion that could be glycine in an ionized form um, and then we see these other little peaks uh, on the histogram here. And the most abundant one here is this big tall peak here. The most abundant species is set to 100%, and so that's said to be 100% relative abundance. And so that would be this fragment of the glycine amino acid, this H2, its amino group, and these two hydrogens from this part of the glycine here. Uh, and then there are some other minor species in here. So based on kind of known fingerprints of certain standards and certain other molecules, we know that with a mass to charge ratio of 30, um, that that is most likely to be this structure here. So we can look at simple structures like glycine, a simple amino acid, the simplest amino acid we could, we could draw, all the way to complex mixtures. Uh, and we can tune the instruments so that the electromagnets are stronger or weaker. And that gives us different times of flight to the detector. And so we can do complicated analysis and we can basically look at complex mixtures of, of molecules to see how do uh, the different components uh, change. Um, before we often do these analysis, we do actually have to purify um, like subspecies of molecules. So if we go back to our example of two plates of cells, sample one and sample two, we'd often have to um, do something to make the samples less complex because we couldn't do it on 
those complete sets of cellular molecules would have to do some kind of fractionation and purification before we could do some mass spec. So that's mass spec. Um, it's a great technique for identifying uh, unknown compounds in complex mixtures. Um, and so this is useful if you want to compare how uh, cellular components have changed in response to changes in, changes in gene expression or changes in environmental conditions or that kind of thing. So that's it. That's mass spec. Nice and quick again. Um, we'll be back next time to take a quick review, a uh, quick look at some properties of water.